Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. Joining us today is Kate Sills. She's a software developer and researcher in the area of smart contracts. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Kate. Well, thanks for having me. What's a smart contract? Yeah, uh, so that's a really good question. And it's actually a really contentious issue in the in the uh, cryptocurrency community. So uh, let me start with what a smart contract is not. Despite the name, a smart contract has nothing to do with artificial intelligence or uh, machine learning or robotics or anything like that. Uh, a smart contract is actually just dumb code. It's also not a legally binding contract, which I think throws a lot of people off. Uh, but what it is is a way that people can uh, create credible commitments with one another. And you can do this with strangers even across the globe. It's it's really revolutionary. But, you know, I think the name itself, it's like people have a tendency to uh, view new technology in terms of old technology. So I call this the horseless carriage problem uh, because when cars first came out, right, you know, they were known as horseless carriages. And I think people are doing the same thing with smart contracts uh, just because of the name. They're comparing them to, to legal contracts, but they're not legally binding. And uh, they have a lot of differences than a legal contract, just like how a uh, car solves the same problem as a, as a carriage. Both legal contracts and smart contracts uh, solve the problem of commitments, right? So the original problem, uh, going back to like, uh, Thomas Hobbes in 1651, right, with Leviathan, was uh, how do you get people to actually keep their promises, right? How do you how do you enforce that? Uh, because he said words alone aren't enough for you to uh, force someone to keep their promises. You need some kind of coercive power over them both, right? So uh, it was assumed that government was the way to do that, but this is a way to do that without government coercion. So contracts to, to a lawyer means... Uh, a promise that the government will enforce, right. basically. And it has to have these characteristics because people can make promises like, hey, I promise to pick you up tomorrow. And the distinction is is that if I don't, you can get the government to either compensate or do something to say you, you reneged on this promise in, in a way that is unacceptable. Um, so maybe, so you said contracts is the wrong word for this. Do you have a word you prefer? Because I see this yeah. constantly in the blockchain world where the metaphors might, as you said, if you have a difficulty here, so even mining when it comes, that's like a bad metaphor in its right. own way. Is, is Would there be some better way of calling them, do you think? Like, are they itemized trustless agreement systems or something like that? Yeah, I, I like the word, um, or I like the phrase self-enforcing commitments, because I, I think that's, that's what they are. Uh, once you release the code and it goes out to the blockchain, um, it's automatically enforced. Um, and I think the commitment part really uh, puts into perspective the the importance of it, right? You're you're able to make agreements with all of these different kinds of people, even if you don't personally know them, you don't even know what the reputation is. Um, and so, yeah, I like I like the term uh, self enforcing commitments. What's the relationship between smart contracts and blockchain? Because these, I mean, the notion that we could have contracts or contract for like agreement written in code could have existed, I mean, as long as we've had code. Right. So, but these always get talked about in the context of blockchain technology. So is there something about blockchain technology that enables these? Were these possible before? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Well, we've always had kind of an electronic version of contract, right? So there's like EDI systems where you, you know, it's the contract itself is encoded and, you know, businesses will exchange information that way. But what is really important about uh, smart contracts is that they're enforced on the blockchain, so they're enforced by a consensus of your peers. So each computer that's connected to this network is actually running that code. And if they don't come to the same conclusion as all the other computers in the network, then the consensus breaks down. To me, the, the really special thing is that having something enforced by the consensus of your peers uh, is something that we've never been able to do before. It's been the opportunity costs have been too high to try to do that, right? If I mean, in the time of the, the founding fathers, if you were doing that, you'd have to like, you know, send letters to everyone, right? It's a, it's a technological issue uh, that we've been able to overcome. Which I guess the, kind of the letters thing reminds me of a, a – was I read a lot about the founding and, the, and you'd go to a new city – uh, and someone like George Washington might give you a letter of introduction to take to someone that he knew in that city because you don't have a reputation. Uh, and that's sort of the very, very basic way of trying to get 
this kind of reputation economy as opposed to being like, you know, all these people sent letters and said this person is is reputable and they all agreed on it and they did it very quickly, which is kind of what the blockchain does. But when it, when it comes to the blockchain, from what I know about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, you have this other proof of work issue where where you have one computer try to solve a, a very difficult problem, which makes it rare. Would that be a part of the smart contracts in the same way that it is for Bitcoin or, or Ether as a currency, for example? Yeah. So uh, so proof of work or proof of stake, or they, they have multiple different ways of doing it, but those are all ways to secure the system itself. And then um, smart contracts work on top of that system. Let's see. You can think of it as like, so when you're trying to create a, a ledger that everyone agrees on, um, it's almost like internet voting, right? So the problem of internet voting is, you know, someone could just create multiple accounts, right? And be able to vote, vote multiple times. It's like every IMDB music yeah. m- movie page, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so you have huge problems with that. So the way that you cut that down is to make sure that uh, there's, no one, there's no way that someone can actually create multiple accounts very easily. And the way to ensure that is to make them go through all of this work just to be able to have any say in the process. The system itself is secured by proof of work, and then smart contracts are built on top of that. And uh, so the code is run. So like the the smallest smart contract is just a transaction, right? You're just sending uh, money from one account to another. But you can add conditions to that. So you could say, you know, uh, only send this after a certain time, and the money would sit in that smart contract until that time. Maybe that gets into more of the details that it would be... Upon X, the code would say upon when X happens, then release the money. Um, but and, and so is that part, is that the block? Is that part of it? Would the thing that we would get into the blockchain? Uh, or am I just, see, this is every time I talk about coding, this, see, Aaron knows more about coding than I do. And, and he's looking at me like I'm a crazy person because because I don't, I, it's, it, well, how does that book, actually Trevor. become part of the block? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so you have to write the code. Uh, to the blockchain, and that gets um, that gets put into the blockchain by a miner, or uh, depending on what platform you're in, uh, uh, the baker or whatever they're calling it. Um, so uh, yeah, so um, let's see. So one example of a smart contract might be like an options contract, right? So that's that's pretty easy to write in code. You would just say. Uh, I am giving someone the option to buy this thing. Maybe you know it's a stock or what have you, uh, at a certain price by a certain time. So all of that logic can be encoded pretty simply. So we typically hear about these within the context of Ethereum, mm-hmm. but the the big blockchain crypto thing that has all the attention is Bitcoin. Um, is there? Why is this an Ethereum thing? Mm-hmm. Um, and could this be or is this also a Bitcoin thing? So Bitcoin does have smart contracts. They're just very, very simple. So like the uh, tools that you can use in Bitcoin are like uh, checking someone's electronic signature to make sure that it's correct, that they have the authority to send something. Um, you can uh, do what's called a multi-sig wallet, which is like uh, saying that like two out of three parties have to sign in order for a transaction to happen. But if you want to do more complicated things, which in most cases you you do, you need to have more tools to use. And so that's what Ethereum and some other platforms have introduced is just um, more conditions that you can use more, you know, like you want to do something conditioned on a timestamp, um, things like that. When we talk about Ethereum, there's, there's a, another thing that always kind of confuses me, the term built on, when we say this is being built on Ethereum. Um, is, is this just mean that the Ethereum coding platform is sort of the backdrop of this? Um, is, is that all that's really saying? Because I, I hear they say these smart contracts are being built on Ethereum or even some websites and stuff are being built on Ethereum. Is, is it just the background coding? Is that really what we're talking about? Um, yeah. So the, the code will be run on uh, one of these platforms. And that just means that certain computers will choose to be part of the Ethereum network or the Bitcoin network or whatever it is, and they'll be running whatever code is pushed up to the blockchain. So when people are saying this is built on the Ethereum platform or this is you know built on the Bitcoin platform, what they're saying is that uh, the code, when it's actually run, is going to be run just like any of the regular transactions. 
and it's going to be confirmed by all of the computers in the network. And if, and if you're one of the computers that's confirming a smart contract, would this also, would you get ether from doing that? Generally, by doing the computation, adding the blockchain, would you get some ether for that? I, potentially. I mean, it, uh, so... Or why would you do it otherwise? Right, right, right. So uh, one way is that um, people have an interest in just securing the network, um, you know, and making sure, checking that it's correct. But, like like uh, Wikipedia, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But if you, if you are the one uh, doing the mining, then you do get a reward for that if you're the one adding transactions to the blockchain and uh, being kind of like the first one to validate it that way. You do get a reward for that for sure. So the first time I remember hearing about smart contracts was in a rather negative light, which was the the DAO issue. Um, so can you first tell us what that was, what happened there, um, and then what is that? Is that like a problem for smart contract technology going forward? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so with the DAO, what happened was. Um, that it was intended to be a way for people to come together and invest in different things. So you would put your money in and then there was some kind of voting mechanism that would allow you to choose what it was that the money would go into. Um, so that is actually a really great use of smart contracts because uh, once you put the money in, no one's able to touch it, right? So if you were to do this without smart contracts, you would have to have an extreme amount of trust in whoever is holding the money or they'd have to you know, be uh, closely audited or, you know, it, that would be a problem, right? Was this, so this was like kind of crowdsourced venture capital? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good description. So, but what happened was there was a, a bug in the code that allowed someone to take out a whole bunch of the money. So one of the limitations of smart contracts is that it's only secure, only as secure as the code that you write. And uh, outside of that, there are pretty much no guarantees that there's any kind of safety. <laughs> so you, you can't go to a court and say, hey, my smart contract was hacked. Please, please help me out, right? So they were hacked and a significant amount of money was taken. I think it was something like maybe like 15% of the total Ethereum, uh, total Ether at the time. What the Ethereum community decided to do was to do a, a hard fork basically to uh, like uh, break off from that ledger into a, a new history in which that hadn't happened. So that was the way that they were able to kind of reclaim that money from the hacker, which is great that they were able to do that. But unfortunately, it does undermine the whole system of the immutable smart contract where in a contract, if someone is able to be powerful enough to uh, breach the contract and then get away with it, like that's that undermines your whole concept of contract, right? So, uh, so it, it does kind of undermine Ethereum's goal, but um, I think that was very early in their history, and they've kind of learned from that. So, more recently, um, there have been uh, attacks that have happened, and they haven't done a, a fork based on that. So, so that's an example of. I don't know if it's a failure so much of smart contracts because it's an evolving system and right. you, you're looking for holes in an evolutionary sense. What about successes? Yeah. So um, I think there's some really exciting things being built. So one of those things is uh, prediction markets. So in a prediction market, it's uh, it's like you're buying a stock, but it's um, you're you're betting on the outcome of an event. So it could be uh, whether, you know, who gets elected president, things like that. And uh, the great thing is that it allows everyone to kind of crowdsource their information. And the, the price of that stock is basically an estimation of what's going to happen. So uh, people are they're putting skin in the game. Um, so it's not just someone going on TV, you know, able to, you know, state whatever opinions, right? This, these are people who are actually putting their money into it. Um, so uh, the the really cool thing is that uh, it's a way for people to create markets out of pretty much any kind of information, and then an outsider can go and look at that and and see what you know people who have insider knowledge on these things are going to be using that basically. And uh, so, you know, it's probably the best predictions that you're going to get. And there have been studies that have shown that. So that's one thing that people are building right now. Most things are still in progress and, and still being tested and all of that. So in terms of like clear success cases, I'm not sure if we have those yet. Um, I think it's very clear that the, the there's a lot of potential there. So on the prediction markets, 
why would those benefit from smart contracts and distributed ledger? Because mm -hmm. we have prediction markets right now. Like we have Betfair right. and there's that election betting odds site that aggregates them and people are doing this through centralized systems. So what's the what's the advantage of doing it from a smart contract? Right. Well, I think it, it depends on how much you can trust that centralized system. So um, in some cases, that might be a good idea. And in some cases, that might be a bad idea. And then also one benefit is being able to create any of your own markets. So if there isn't a market for whatever it is that they want to bet on, they can just create that. And then um, a, a third thing is eventually, um, I think you might be able to uh, package up some of these, some of these bets and uh, take them, you could take them to a new uh, system. So like you can you can actually take some of these um, uh, virtualized commodities and uh, be able in, to buy and trade those. So it's one thing to say we're going to write a smart contract that, you know, $10 of mine are going to get held and then on February 1st are going to get transferred to Trevor's wallet because mm -hmm. um, February 1st is an obvious date. Um, but for more nebulous things, how do we – what triggers the smart contract and how do we – like it can't be you – know, there's, there's a lot of conditionals that can't be themselves included in the code because it's like you know, was the average temperature X higher this year or whatever. So how do you, how do you trigger the terms and who gets to decide? Right, right. So, uh, so that is a major limitation of smart contracts is because they run on the blockchain and anything that runs on the blockchain has to be deterministic. If you have uh, the same inputs, you have to get the same output. They can't pull down code from external sources. So they can't go to a website, uh, let's say a weather website, and pull in the temperature. Um, but what you can do is you can have people who push that to the blockchain. So in, you can't pull it, but you can push it to the blockchain. The problem there is Wait, that- Can you uh, clarify that sure. metaphor, please? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, the blockchain itself can't go outside of it. Um, but someone, you can always write data to the blockchain. So uh, let's say you want to get data about the weather. Um, you can't go outside and access uh, weather.com or whatever it is, but you could have a trusted source go to weather.com, look it up, and write it to the blockchain. So the, the problem there is that uh, you're relying on these trusted sources, and they're called oracles. But there are, uh, there are different ways that people are getting around that. Um, they're... Uh, these oracles might have certain reputations, um, and you might be combining like five of them or something like that, so that even if someone manages to hack a certain website, you're not, um, you know, uh, ruining the consistency of the whole prediction market system. Um, so uh, that is definitely a limitation of smart contracts, but I think people are working around that. I mean, the interesting thing about from a legal standpoint is that in contract law, we do talk about. Uh, the way that you know it's mutual obligations as a basic is what a contract is, and certain obligations trigger mm -hmm. counter performance. And so you can, let's take a rent a rental contract. And then one of the things I had read about this preparing for this episode is kind of said let's say you're paying rent on you know February first and you know not that far in the future I get you could do it now but let's say your the house is opened up a digital with a digital key as opposed to a physical key and so upon you paying rent uh, and it gets written and it gets confirmed and then the digital key opens up the house and that's how you continue to live in your house but there are multiple conditions that go into like renting a house where so the maintenance of the appliances for example where people I, pe people come to me and say all the time it's like oh my my fridge doesn't work, therefore I'm not going to pay rent next year, ne next month. And I'm like, well, that that the the non-existence of the fridge obligation does not totally relieve you of your obligation to pay rent. In actuality, what we would do is we would negotiate, oh, uh, you know, maybe two hundred dollars off your rent, but that requires lawyers and things like that. That all seems really complex. And while you could just say, open the door, I paid rent. That's a smart contract, but but most disputes and rental disputes, for example, are not that. They're how much performance did they give, and how much performance do I have to give, and that's not that's not code. Right. It doesn't seem codable to me, or, right. or maybe it is. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. So, the way that I see smart contracts is that they're they're only useful in certain cases. They probably wouldn't replace all legal contracts because um, you do have that uh, like 
what is it, ex post like negotiation phase, right? Where yeah. you would want to, um, you know, maybe <clears throat> the real world isn't exactly how you expected and you need to renegotiate. I think uh, smart contracts are really useful for when you want a, a like very severely binding commitment. And, um, you know, like, for instance, maybe uh, you want to be able to make a deal with someone that you don't think would have your best interests in heart in that kind of negotiation, and you don't want them to be able to back out of it. You know, it, it goes back to kind of like what contract was for in the first place. So, you know, um, I had mentioned Thomas Hobbes, uh, you know, in Leviathan way back in 1651 or whatever. Um, so, you know, when when uh, the words aren't enough for to bind men, right, you have to Thomas Hobbes argued you need some kind of uh, coercive power over them both. You know, smart contracts are used for that circumstance where uh, you don't think that this person will be able to work things out for you or you don't think uh, the courts will actually be able to rule in your favor. So maybe you're not in the U.S., maybe you're in some other country where uh, this person that you're dealing with is a, a powerful figure who... Uh, might be able to bribe officials or, uh, you know, might the the courts won't necessarily rule in your favor. Or just um, have more money for lawyers. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's a really good point. So uh, Nobel Prize winning economist Oliver Williamson has this uh, this term legal centralism for the belief that courts are, you know, the, the best way to enforce contracts and, uh, you know, they're cheap and easy. And none of those things are actually true. It's not that smart contracts are, are cheap and easy either. But I think there may be certain circumstances in which they're more valuable than uh, taking it to a court. And, um, you know, it might depend on what country you're in. There's also the possibility for private arbitration um, on the blockchain just because uh, so you can, you know, write and read things to the blockchain. And some of those could be the judgments of uh, private arbitration. You can, you know, encode things that you want to keep um, absolutely immutable and, and keep uh, and make sure that they are that they are enforced. And then you can also, um, you know, outside of maybe like the 95% of cases that you think you can encode, you could uh, send that out for private arbitration, like take that judgment as an input to this function. And so there's actually a lot of historical precedent for this. So back in medieval times, the merchant class, when they were going through all of the different you know, countries and they would have disputes with people from different countries, there was no clear legal jurisdiction for them oftentimes. And even if they were able to take it to court, uh, the judge wouldn't necessarily know anything about what they were doing because, you know, they had all these specialized agreements and things. So they kind of created their own judges and their own private arbitration where they could just settle things right then and there. Um, and so I think this this law merchant is a you know can be used as an example for what could be possible with uh, private arbitration and blockchains. So and private arbitration is used all the time uh, in you know commercial law. I guess I have a technical question about mm -hmm. these. Then, um, when when you were first telling us how they worked, you mentioned so if we were doing a payment thing that you know triggered on a certain date, that if I were going to pay Trevor on a certain date, I would take – this contract would basically take a set of funds and lock them up within the contract and then release them to Trevor. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of instances where payment on a future date or payment on some condition, we don't want that to take the funds away from me right now, right? So like a loan or something where right. I need to use the, f the funds or I expect to have enough like rent. You know, you wouldn't want me to constantly – my rent to be – you know, all the rent I'm going to pay going on into the future is taken out of my paycheck now. So is there – is it possible to do that too or do you always have to take the funds and lock them up in this thing before you can even get started? Yeah. So for the most part, uh, that is a major limitation. You do actually have to take the funds and lock them up because there is no way for um, – you know, and, and this is kind of a, a personal protection is that there's no way for the blockchain to take money out of your account. There's no – there's no like you know taking money out of your paycheck or you know whatever it is that we would use in the real world to uh, you know enforce someone to pay their debts. Um, so so yeah so that money actually has to be put away and and there's an opportunity cost for that. You can't use that money for anything else. Uh, so that is a major limitation of smart contracts right now. But uh, I think there are instances in which um, you might want to put up a bond or put money into a contract and have it be secure, and that would outweigh whatever opportunity costs there might be. 
I wanted to ask about, I mean, we talked about smart contracts within the context of Bitcoin where they're extremely limited and within the context of Ethereum where they weren't more versatile. But are there other technologies out there now or emerging that are even better and might enable us to get around some of these limitations? A lot is being done on Ethereum. There are other platforms like uh, Tezos or Cardano or Definity, things like that. Even with the limitations, I think there's still a lot that you can do. So um, we had mentioned prediction markets, a, a lot of things where it's like you can encode all of the potential possibilities. So like financial derivatives, like uh, actually uh, Hernando de Soto, uh, the Peruvian economist who wrote The Mystery of Capital, he's working right now on a blockchain solution for property title. So uh, and the smart contract in that case would be the exchange, the, the buying of selling and selling of property title. So I think um, you, there are cases in which you can kind of uh, try to um, encode all of that, or at least like 95 percent of it. You, you want that to be enforced. So going back to what you said, Trevor, about that kind of negotiation after the fact, there are there are a lot of cases like Alaska Packers or whatever that is where uh, you know you've made the contract, but then uh, once you actually go into performing on that contract, someone might realize that you've made that commitment already and try to take advantage of that. So if that's something that you're really worried about, the a smart contract might be the way to ensure that there is no way that you can renegotiate that once they've, you know, once you've already committed. You mentioned Tezos which I know from your Twitter feed is something that you talk a lot about. So what is Tezos and how does it fit into all of this? Sure. Um, so Tezos is kind of an Ethereum competitor. Uh, they started around the same time. Tezos put out a white paper in uh, 2014. And um, their focus is is trying to make uh, business contracts. Uh, so uh, the co-founders, uh, Kathleen and Arthur Brightman, are kind of from, from the, the finance area. So they're hoping instead of Ethereum, which is kind of like, you know, smart contracts can do anything. So Ethereum has this right now, one of their major apps is this thing called CryptoKitties, which is like virtual uh, trading cards, basically, that have like a little cat on them. And you can uh, you can buy and sell those and like breed them together and get a new cat. So they're, they've like very much embraced um, like, you know, you can do anything with this. But I think uh, Tezos is interested in... Um, using it for more of these like uh, business use cases where, uh, you know, you might just want a very simple contract just to make sure that whatever it is that you're trying to promise each other is actually enforced. When, when it comes to the writing the terms of the blockchain, how much of a problem is it that they getting them, you can't, it's hard to take things off the blockchain or if not impossible, um, where you you make a contract with, so you don't, in PayPal, I could I'd say I, I did a contract with someone on an eBay transaction and it was upon shipment of this thing and then the funds are released and given to them and written to the blockchain. And then when I get it, uh, it's either defective or, it's a, or maybe it's a counterfeit or something like that. Uh, how do you get, how can you go back and be like, no, 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 I want my money back because it's, it's, it's written into the chain now. That's something that people are working on. But um, part of the security of the whole system is that you can't go back and rewrite things. So people definitely don't want to undermine that. Um, but what you could do is you could have a what we were talking about, a multi-sig wallet where, uh, you know, if everything goes well, uh, the seller approves it, you know, you, the buyer, you approve the transaction, right? You've gotten your good and the transaction happens. But if something doesn't go right, then there might be some kind of uh, third party that would be able to kind of uh, adjudicate that and you know decide where the money should go. Um, so there's there are ways to get around that, but uh, the security of the system is you know based on ensuring that you can't actually change anything that's happened previously in the ledger. But but does that mean that maybe people for something like that the the blockchain is not the optimal. I mean, maybe people, if you told them, uh, okay, well, this is really hard to take back and we have a way around it, but it might take all these different things. But actually, this one of the services that PayPal offers is you can say, stop, stop this right now. And, and people say, okay, for, so for maybe for eBay transactions, the blockchain just 
won't actually be something people want to use in smart contracts in the blockchain. Yeah, well, I think it, you know, it really all depends on uh, what your use case is. If your use case is like ease of use, then the blockchain probably isn't for you, right? It's kind of like, um, you know, if if you don't care about who's looking at your email, right, you could just use Gmail or whatever it is, and that's probably the best option. But uh, if you, you know, if you have a specialized case where you don't necessarily want to uh, trust someone like PayPal, um, you know, you are able to uh, make those exchanges with other people. And right now it is a little bit more complicated, but I think we'll see a lot more of the kind of like user-friendly uh, apps. There's, uh, there are, you know, decentralized marketplaces right now um, that have been working on that sort of thing. And so I think, you know, once that becomes more popular, it'll probably become more like, easier to use. A lot of libertarians like this tech, both the, I mean, blockchain and cryptocurrencies and smart contract uh, because it fits into grand utopian crypto anarchist visions of, you know, you have a presentation you did on smart contracts and ordered anarchy um, of, you know, we can, this is how we can make it so we don't need the state. You know that we there's there's things that we thought we needed the state for, but we can replace them with technology, um, and and I admit that's a really I mean for me a really exciting vision, um, but one one concern or question I have about it is we talk about these things as if this is just I mean this is just kind of technology that exists out there we can use it, but this is technology being created by people, um, it's overseen by people or organizations who it's. Because it's tech, it needs to be updated. It needs to have bugs fixed, um, and so there's a, as with any you know large software open source project, there's like a governance issue at play. And one thing that's become apparent, especially over maybe the last year, is that a lot of the times in the space, the governance seems pretty broken or dysfunctional. Um, the people who are in it are. Either you know too art ideologically hardcore to function you know to to actually make the technology change in ways it needs to, um, or are simply dysfunctional, uh, and so is there is there a problem there with shifting from essentially entrusting this highly troublesome government that we have that has all sorts of problems and has incompetent people in it, it has bad people in it, in addition to competent and good people, but is at least, you know, we have mechanisms in place where we can correct it as the people. It's like answerable in a, you know, sometimes superficial way, but it's answerable to us. From shifting from that to relying on technology and ultimately code as law that's being overseen by some random hacker somewhere, often anonymous people, you know, organizations that don't even really exist on paper, like are just – there isn't a thing there and there aren't institutions in place. Well, I think anytime you have any sort of collective action, right, you have a governance problem. Like even if you're deciding where to go to lunch with your coworkers, that's still a governance problem. How do you decide that? You know, uh, how do you decide that fairly? What if there's one minority voice that really loves a certain restaurant and uh, you never, ever go there, right? So anytime you have some kind of collective action problem where you're trying to make a group decision, uh, I think you're going to have a governance problem. And then the question is, how do you how do you fairly resolve that? So uh, in a lot of the, the cryptocurrency platforms right now, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, it's kind of an ad hoc thing. And so that means that there's a lot of vicious Twitter fights, basically, especially in the Bitcoin <laughs> community. Uh, you know, some people are trying to formalize that. So Tezos, for example, uh, is really trying to uh, formalize that and put the governance itself on the blockchain. As libertarians, I think we often get told by other people like government is just us working together, right? And 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 then you know our reaction is well, you know, usually people working together don't force you to do things, <laughs> right? Or like they're uh, we didn't consent to this. Um, but I think the special thing about uh, blockchain is that because you can you can exit, right? So unlike a, a geographic uh, territory where like uh, the government there is, uh, you know, it's it's harder to exit, right? You have to actually move and, and go away from all of your friends and family and move all of your stuff. Um, on the blockchain, 
you could just uh, sell out and you know move to something else. Or you could do a, a fork, which is kind of like a political revolution in a way, and you know try to convince people to go your direction. Even though we like, there's not necessarily the accountability, right? There's not like you can't. There's not a a, a way in which you can voice uh, your opinions very easy, except uh, on Twitter or something like that. Um, you do have you do always have that exit option uh, in a way that's easier than the kind of uh, governance that we're used to seeing in the real world. But I, I think we will see in the next couple of years uh, people really trying out different governance systems. So. Uh, uh, you know, different ways of trying to uh, make collective action decisions and make group decisions. And I think that's something that's going to be really cool to see, especially with smart contracts, um, because you can use smart contracts to bind yourself to whatever decisions it is. Um, so, you know, you might put up a bond or something like that that might be slashed if you don't adhere to whatever rules you agreed to. Um, and but I think that's it's still an open area of study, um, definitely in its infancy, and uh, I'm excited to see where it goes. For a very long time, we studied government and mm -hmm. and you know, James Madison before the Constitution sits down and reads all these books about government and how do we make it better. It's it's always a work in progress. So with this new technology, I guess that we're trying to figure some of these things out too. But but. There was an article um, in December that got some amount of attention, at least in, in my news feed, by a guy named Kai Stinchcomb called, 10 years in, nobody has come up for with a use for blockchain, mm -hmm. criticizing many of the purported applications. And on smart truck contracts, he writes, the investors and startups in the smart contract space promise that the blockchain will enable super fast execution and payment. For example, that in healthcare applications, instead of waiting 90 to 180 days for a claim to be processed or spending hours on the phone trying to get your bill paid, it can in theory be processed on the spot. But that's true of any software-enabled purchasing system. My company's Amazon servers scale automatically based on website traffic and bill us for how much we use. The idea that smart contracts would change this is a fallacy. It conflates the legal arrangement being put into effect with the software and the legal arrangement itself being coded as software. Amazon's terms of service are not a smart contract, but the billing system that implements those terms is automated. To the extent that health insurance billing, for example, is not automated, the problem isn't that existing software isn't smart enough to handle su submitting claims and paying them electronically. It's that the insurance company is slow moving, moving either by accident or because the on purpose, they prefer a human review. How do you respond to that critique? Yeah, well, I don't disagree with it. I think, um, you know, uh, blockchains are very slow, right? Uh, the Their advantage is not that they're faster or, you know, I think a lot of that comes from this idea that uh, smart contracts have something to do with AI, that they're smarter. But, mm -hmm. you know, uh, actually, in a lot of ways, they're dumber, right? They can only do certain things in certain ways. Um, so I don't disagree with that necessarily, but I do think uh, the use case for blockchain and smart contracts in particular has to do with uh, the collective action problems that I was talking about and the social consensus, right? So uh, money is a you know, social consensus, right? Uh, property title is also a social consensus, right? It's the agreement of everyone else to not violate the rights that have been defined uh, that you have ownership of. Um, and so all of those things, uh, when you look at the, you know, the system, the, the machine that that runs on right now, it is incredibly slow, right? That's government. <laughs> so, you know, I have a friend who's been trying to get the title for his car for like almost a year now. And he's been driving the car around, but he's, he can't get the title for it, so he can't sell it, you know, and, and all of those things. So Hernando de Soto in The Mystery of Capital, his thesis was that people in third world countries, it's not that they are poor because they don't have possessions. It's that they don't have the title to all of these things, right? Uh, they're missing the institutions. They're missing the the. Uh, rule of law that would allow them to use their property as collateral or, uh, you know, to, to leverage it in all of these different ways, right? It's the mental representation of their property that they're missing. And uh, the strength of blockchain is that you're able to uh, create that kind of social consensus and uh, put it in a ledger and make it immutable and allow you to buy and sell and trade that. Um, so I think... The use case for smart contracts isn't necessarily that you would be paying, um, you know, a uh, 
insurance company or trying to bypass an insurance company or anything like that. Using that as like your new payment system, yeah. Right. Um, I think, you know, digital currencies themselves are, are really, really important uh, because, you know, it's it makes it much easier to cross borders and, uh, you know, interact with people throughout the whole world uh, much easier. But uh, for smart contracts, I think there's a couple of things that uh, the situation has to have to make smart contracts useful. And one of those is opportunism. So um, if you have a use case in which you think someone is going to take advantage of you, so Oliver Williamson defines this as uh, self-interest with guile. Um, and a lot of contracts, you know, that happens. So like we can imagine back in Hobbes time, like in the 1600s, let's say I have a pig that I want to, you know, sell at the market and a farmer wants to buy it and he agrees to give me his harvest next fall. Right. Uh, you know, and we make that agreement and I give him the pig and then the next fall rolls around and he might say, hey, you know, I didn't have any kind of deal. Right. Like so that kind of uh, opportunism, right, taking when the opportunity arises, using it for your own self-interest. Um, I think that usually indicates uh, that you need some kind of outside enforcement. So either that's a legal contract or a smart contract, uh, but you need some some way to enforce it. Um, so I think when you have cases of opportunism, that involves some some kind of social consensus um, that's needed. So like things to do with property title or uh, you know long term long term contracts and things like that, yeah. where someone could run away or something. Yeah. Right, right, right. Or you know maybe your your situation, you live in a country that doesn't have uh, uh, secure institutions and you you don't trust them. Um, I think that's where the blockchain really shines. Is that it's. It's uh, the blockchain is not trying to replace, uh, you know, our our programming and our you know our our Amazon servers and all of that. It's trying to replace, um, you know, how we interact with each other and how we uh, try to get each other to cooperate. So it's trying to replace that collective action layer. So which is has for the most part been a service provided by government. And uh, I think if you if you look in most cases, that is incredibly slow if it functions at all. <laughs> Are you familiar with um, the verification system for indentures? Mm -hmm. uh, hanging on my office wall is a indenture, a contract written for someone to be in indentured servitude for seven years coming over, the standard story. The, the term indenture actually means the scroll at the top of the contract. So when you were indentured and then someone held the indenture for you, it was a it was a big piece of paper and you each had a copy and then the, you cut it in a scroll and the way you verified it was was to match them up against each other. And that's how you would, you know, seven, seven years later, you come back and like, you know, or 20 years where you might look really different and you have to prove, you know, the same person. So you, you put the two scrolls up against each other. And again, it says, this is the, I'm the original holder of this. This is the indenture. It kind of is one of these technologies they try to invent to verify a, a transaction and keep it over a long period of time as opposed to just a handshake deal like right now you want these chickens yeah okay here's some money I'll buy them later but if you have a 20 year thing you might need something a little bit a little bit more for that right and yeah there are a whole bunch of ways that people have tried to come up with to uh, make it more probable that someone's going to keep their promise or like so uh, like Oliver Williamson and uh, other people in kind of the law and economics uh, subfield call this private ordering, right? So you might you might rely on like uh, personal ethics, right? You might only make deals with someone that you think is a good person, right? But you know, like that kind of information is hard to come by. That right? also makes you probably pretty poor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it really limits all of your transactions, and you might rely on like reputations, right? You might uh, ask other people you know, what their previous transactions with this person have been. Um, and so, you know, in game theory, that's taking like a single instance game and turning it into a repeated game because people have an incentive to cooperate in order to ensure that the next, you know, they have uh, an opportunity to take that next deal. So I think, you know, um, what smart contracts provide is not necessarily uh this is the way that you must do things. You must make this binding contract. It's a way to allow people in code to 
use whatever level of uh, mechanism that they need to use in order to try to ensure that someone will keep their promise. So you, um, in a lot of these systems, you know, they're using things like reputation in order to try to ensure that. So, you know, that gives you a little bit more leeway in negotiations while still trying to secure that promise. The idea of it is that there is no one particular way that is above and beyond the way that you should do things. Different use cases, you know, need different types of tools, and this is a new tool that we have. You mentioned immutability and trust a fair amount, and that this is a way for people who might not otherwise have access to the rule of law effectively to use a trusted system that can't be changed. But at the beginning of our conversation, we talked about the DAO and hard forks, which was basically up and changing. And it's not and it's not just so if if you and I make a contract and then a corrupt state court decides not to enforce it or rewrites the terms or something like that, our contract has been screwed up. But a contract that I have with Trevor still is around, right? But if these are all written to the same blockchain and then the guys at Ethereum decide that they want to hard fork it in order to save the 15 percent of Ethereum that was caught up in this thing, that also rewrote or went back on every single other contract that was in existence at the time, right? Um, or that had happened between when the point that they decided to hard fork and you know everything that happened after that. And so that's like an extraordinarily huge level of mutability. Is that a concern that you know these people in poor countries that you could just buy you know say fifty one percent of the miners deciding they could wipe out every single contract and every single claim to come to property across the whole world? Yeah, so I think um, it's important to view it in layers because I think uh, in any institution, right? Let's say in the U.S. we have uh, we have the Constitution, we have that rule of law, and um, you know we can we can make contracts. But if someone, uh, you know, invaded the U.S. or somehow the government got overthrown, right, uh, all of those might be in question, right? So I think you have to view it in layers and say, like, as long as the system itself is secure, then your contract is secure. So uh, – but it, I think you're right. That is – a. Um, you know, something that is concerning, right? You don't, you definitely don't want people to be able to uh, upend the whole system. Like it takes a, a, a ton of uh, computing power to actually be able to uh, change the system. And you have to convince everyone to go along with your hard fork if that's the case. Otherwise, uh, you might find yourself in a, you know, a very minority fork where your value goes way down. Really only in very worrying cases that this hard fork scenario might actually happen. I don't think that the example that you gave of a you know contract just between you and another person would not be uh, a case in which that would happen. So the the good thing is is that unlike court that we might experience in real life where we might have fickle decision or a biased court or you know in a different country maybe, um, you know, someone might have been bribed or something like that. On a instance per instance level, it's probably very, very unlikely that it's actually going to be uh, changed, you know, or that it's going to be undermined unless it's something that you're making a deal that is so big that it's like, you know, 20 percent or 30 percent of the you know money in the system. That might be something that people will try to mess with. But I think for you know for the ordinary people, for the little guys, uh, you can you can count on the system. Going forward, um, what do you see as sort of like the th the things we should look for smart contracts maybe in the near term and then and then in the long term as someone is actually working on this, uh, you know where 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 do you think in the next ten years will we start seeing these things maybe pop up? So one thing that's really interesting is that some people are starting to use uh, smart contracts for like uh, for debt. So being able to to buy and sell debt um, and do so in a way that you know crosses borders, and um, so that's that's one thing that's really interesting. And connected to that is um, the idea that you know if we did have property title on the blockchain, uh, you know, in a certain country or something like that, uh, investors worldwide would be able to buy and sell that. So like basically it's unleashing all of this uh, captured 
uh, you know, economic activity that has kind of been siloed into each geographic jurisdiction and allowing people to um, connect worldwide. So, you know, you can't you're not only just allowed to invest in your own country's stuff, uh, you can exchange those things with anyone in the world. Those are the kinds of use cases that I'm really excited about. Um, I think also one one use case that has been really undervalued is the ability to uh, create commitments outside of something that the court might enforce. Thomas Schelling talked about this way back in the in the 1950s. Uh, he wrote a paper on bargaining, and his argument was that it was counterintuitively. If you're able to bind yourself in certain circumstances, it actually gives you a lot more power in bargaining. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not a legal scholar, but uh, you know the courts do not enforce uh, one-party contracts. You know, with well, yourself that, that, for the it most doesn't part, actually, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense. It, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's incoherent. Yes. Yeah, There's no yeah. meeting of the minds. Yes. Right. 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 You know, this is still an area that um, I'm hoping to do more research on. But I think you know we haven't seen what will happen when people can actually create commitments that don't have to uh, be evaluated by a third party. Right. That you can. Um, uh, so, like, one example of this that Thomas Schelling talks about is, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, nuclear deterrence, right? Like, the whole point of having, uh, you know, um, uh, someone, like, if someone's going to attack you, you have, you know, a switch that will automatically attack them, right? That, like, uh, so, like, you could... Not that you would be using this in terms of, uh, you know, nuclear weapons, but you can think of like, uh, you know, maybe you want to uh, put up some kind of a bond that will be slashed if you act in a certain way. Or maybe you're in negotiations with someone and you want to be able to credibly commit to something and convince them that, you know, no, sorry, I can't actually do that. Right. Uh, Like so, for instance, let's say uh, you're an employer negotiating with the union or something like that, and they would like to... uh, raise wages. And if you're able to say, sorry, you know, like, it's literally not possible for me to do that, that actually gives you a lot more bargaining power. As opposed to just say it, like actually commit right. yourself. Yeah, yeah. So there's ways that we just have not explored because we haven't had the the tools to do that. And in this paper, Thomas Schelling says it's uh, it's actually astounding that people, that there's been no way to actually have these kinds of commitment devices with that and with private arbitration and on the blockchain um, and being able to do this outside of all of these geographic jurisdictions, I think there's a lot of potential that still is left to be explored. And I'm hoping, you know, people who are experts in law and economics get really interested and, uh, you know, start start exploring because it is kind of a sandbox for exploration right like if you admire james madison and you you know you're interested in like montesquieu's like uh three branches of government and you want to you know you're like well what would happen if you didn't have that or if you had other you know ways of uh formatting this like it's an open question that you can actually start implementing now and people need it because a lot of the people who are working on blockchain stuff do come from like a computer science background or a finance background and they don't have necessarily the uh, the legal or economic background that you would need to be able to uh, build a governance system or you know try out some of these contract forms or things like that. Free Thoughts is produced by Test Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.